This is Lead Time. Welcome to Lead Time Hot Topic Friday. I pray the joy of the Lord is your strength as we lean into a wonderful conversation today with a brother in Christ, a deacon, a uh, bivocational, really a co-vocational leader in the church up in Alaska, and his name is Ty Shomer. Let me tell you a little bit about Ty before we get going. He has uh, gone through all of the Mission Training Center courses, and as he told me, he goes, I just wanted wanted more and uh, didn't want to be a pastor per se, just wanted to continue in his Lutheran formation. And so he found the uh, Luther uh, Lutheran Institute of, not technology, <laughs> the Institute for Lutheran Theology that has many LCMC, NALC, and LCM stu- LCMS students who are a part of it. And he says, I'm taking a class right now with an LCMS academic, not a pastor, but an LCMS academic, Dr. Jack Kilcrease. We'll have to have him on. And uh, his story, what you're going to hear today from Ty, is just a man that wants to serve at the local level and uh, recognizes that the church needs leaders. And uh, and we're praying for a new day of leadership development in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, for the sake of our existing churches, and more than that, for the sake of the churches that need to be started to reach those who do not know Jesus. So before we get into it, Ty, how you doing, brother? Thanks doing so much really for hanging well. with me. Thanks for having me. And uh, he also is the owner of Arbor Capital Management, and uh, so serving serving co-vocationally, you help uh, people manage their money and make money by doing that. That's awesome, brother, and uh, thank you for serving uh, in, with the ultimate money maker, which is Jesus. Uh, he owns it all, and uh, and he wants more of his kids to be found, uh, those that are lost. So let's talk. First question, start the clock there, Adam, 10 minutes. What is your dream for the role of the laity? in the life of the church, Ty? Well, you know, I guess my dream would be that there would be continued opportunity for those people that just thirst to explore their own spirituality, thirst to serve the church, that there's avenue for them to continue on that path. And that's what drew me in. Um, I was fortunate enough that when I just walked into a church at 19, 20 years old in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, was just looking for a church, was not an LCMS Lutheran, didn't know what any of that stuff meant. But I was devouring scripture um, and going to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, wanted to find a church, walked into Zion Lutheran Church, who happened to be an LCMS church. And they just met me where I was at, took me all the rough edges and everything and really, really just wrapped themselves around me in a missional way, brought me forward, put me in leadership positions, supported me in leadership positions and were very intently missional about that. So that was really kind of my upbringing. I saw that it drew me in and it was wow. And it, and it taught me that That ministry is a shared burden. It's a shared blessing. It's a gift to all of us. And it's not incumbent upon the professional clergy and the commissioned people to, you know, they lead ministry for sure. Um, But it was embedded on me early in my spiritual formation that I was a part of ministry and I was important to ministry. So that's kind of the spirit where all of this comes from. Oh, man, I love that so much. Uh, So... We exist, if you're a leader, Ephesians 4, to equip the saints for love and good deeds, for the works of ministry, both for uh, discipling the found, but also to care for their community and those that are lost from Jesus. So let's go deeper. I think there's there's a, a profound thirst right now among more of the baptized, especially in our LCMS congregations, to go deeper in their theology. We're getting requests in our congregation, hey, what is the... 202, 303 kind of Lutheran teaching classes. Right. And so, I I mean, on, on Sunday mornings, I got about eight to 10 guys that are showing up for a deep conversation. We're reading Luther for armchair theologians right now, and we're digging into digging into the scriptures. It's so much, so much fun. fun. So what is it about, like, when you define Lutheran and we're confessional, not, not liberal necessarily, but confessional right. conservative Lutheranism, what is it that you find so attractive, Ty? Well, what I really, really appreciate about the, 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 the Lutheran perspective, our hermeneutic, is that it is so scripturally based. Um, it doesn't fill in the blanks where there's not clear answer. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah. it doesn't over-rationalize things. It leaves mystery and, you know, as a part of the faith. Um, and it's um, it's just so robust. You know, the history of 
our faith, can, you know, coming out of the Reformation, it had to be defended. It had to be so intellectually rigorous. Um, and that appeals to me. So we've carried that forward. We've done a great job of carrying that forward. We've done a great job of being a beacon um, amongst, you know, Christianity of this is the true gospel message. And we don't deviate from that. So I really appreciate that because most of Protestantism talks about saved by grace and practices some measure of, you know, you know, saved by works. And, and we Lutherans just do such a good job of maintaining that balance of law and gospel. Hey, uh, yeah, Luther's freedom of a Christian. Have you read Luther's freedom of a cr- cr- Christian? Yes, and bondage of the will, which really kind of anchors uh-huh. all that. Um, yeah. And then on the other hand, cost of discipleship is you know um, is a good counterbalance to that too. So yeah, I've read, I've devoured all of those books. Well. Whenever I bring this up, I'm teaching right now. Uh, we don't have a Lutheran high school here in the East Valley of Phoenix. Uh, wish we did, and and uh, we have a hybrid model, but at, here at our church. But we're, my son plays high school football, and so I get to be you know, a coach as well as kind of the the chaplain. Every time I bring, because there's kids that come from mostly evangelical kind of backgrounds, non-denom churches, things like that. Uh, every time I bring kind of Luther's teaching, namely the two kinds of righteousness and even the the paradox-filled uh, freedom of a Christian statement uh, that the Christian is the perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none, and at the same time, the Christian is the perfectly free or perfectly a, a slave to all, subject to all, servant to all, subject to all, and then you're able to de- decipher, hey, before God, <laughs> it is by faith alone, right? And now it gets carried out in love for neighbor. Does your neighbor need your good works? Uh, Yes, they do. Does God need them? No, he doesn't. You're perfectly whole in him. Your identity in Jesus is perfectly whole. Are there any other kind of Lutheran teachings that you're like, man, if the, if the wider Christian church just got a handle on, on, on this teaching, like everything would open up for us. And I, I don't know that right now, Because in the LCMS, we kind of have some of our own kind of struggles. I don't know that we're as um, evangelical across denominations as I wish. I talk to a lot of academics and they like we have to be at the table at a lot of these conversations uh, because what we have is so, so good. We also have things to learn, obviously. But as it relates to, say, the freedom of Luther's understanding of the freedom of a Christian, such a helpful paradigm. Any other Lutheran paradigms that you're like, man, if the wider church knew this? Well, you know, I think you you hit on the main one. Um, The main one being that, you know, the the works that we do, the sanctification of ourselves is a byproduct. Um, It's not the thing in and of itself. Itself. I think that so much of Christianity, especially in the non-denominational arenas that you spoke of, is that we are doing our ministry that serves us in the name of Christ. It's not Jesus first. It's me first under this cultural Christian context. And I see that a lot. So it's just getting back to recognizing that anything that that's good that comes in and through me is a byproduct of what was created in me, not in and of myself. And that's the that's the real crux of, of that, I think. Um, the yeah, sacraments, you, um, of yeah, course, right. you know, yeah. we're a beacon of truth for the sacraments. I mean, the readings last Sunday and John um, just speak to that. This is my body. This is my blood. And that is such a big part of, you know, you know, leading a sacramental life, having the sacraments as front and center as part of our faith walk. Um, that's something that needs to get regenerated as well in the Christian. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and the role of the role of baptism, right? Yep. Uh, and creating faith and sustaining faith, rooting me in my identity as a follower of Jesus. Um, I'm built up now at Jesus teaching in uh, John chapter 15, that a branch connected to the vine, right? right. A healthy tree bears good, good fruit. Uh, but the, the healthy tree has been planted there by the word of God. And therefore the fruit of, of faith, the fruit of uh, a changed life for the sake of the world. This is simply for the world, not for for God, right? And and I love the metaphor. He's going to continue to prune us, right? He's going to continue to prune us. Why? So that we'd bear more fruit, that the love of Jesus would flow through us to the world, that we would be his hands and feet, that we would raise up more people to be proclaimers of the word of God. I don't, and we're going to get into some of the, some of the um, kind of power play struggles between 
the priesthood and maybe maybe pastor, but I just don't understand, I guess, how anyone could read the Bible and not view it as God's divine love letter mission story to the world that God so loved the whole world that he gave his his one and only son and God is on a mission to get his son his sons and daughters back who are who are lost and we simply need more leaders to be raised up and uh, to accomplish that mission with with a mission oriented heart not a not a power me first pastor first but this kind of wide open heart and that's what I see in you and many of our of our deacons Um, who are not recognized now kind of by the wider LCMS, but still recognized in a lot of their local contexts, you being one of them, right? You just want to, you just want to serve. Say more about deacon ministry and lay ministry in general there, Ty. Well, I've been, I've been fortunate to serve in areas um, that where it was just necessary. It was just needed because there isn't enough pastoral, um, enough enough pastors to, to do all of this. Pastors go on vacation. And in the past where I have filled in, and have been supervised. It's just been during vacations, absences, and things of that nature. Um, but since becoming a licensed lay deacon, I've begun to be used in wider because we've uh, wider use because we've got four or five vacancies um, here in Alaska, and so um, that you know it just creates demand. And uh, yeah. so right now, all I am is the path of least resistance, and I'm happy to serve in that capacity. So um, until uh, that changes, there's there's plenty of work to do. Amen. Praise God. All right. Second question. I think we hit right about 10 minutes. That was great. Uh, we did a, at the last Synod convention, a little, little side story. We got, we got booted out of the convention, like in a, in a hallway uh, by Synod leaders. We were unauthorized to, to be there. That's fine. We went out on the street and had more conversation there. But just around this question, do you think the LCMS needs more paths to ordination? Uh, yes or no? And and defend your answer there, Ty. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the demographics dictate that. So, um, you know, the, the LCMS can, um, you know, maintain its current position and continue to diminish in scope, um, you know, mostly from the edges inward. Um, um, or we can try to find ways to use technology to continue to, uh, you know, evolve and continue to use the resources that are now available to us. Um, to expand um, professionally trained church workers. Um, and if um, the LCMS, the reason why I'm taking classes at the Institute of Lutheran Theology, is because there really isn't a, another avenue, um, an LCMS approved avenue. I've looked at them, um, even if me as a, you know, uh, um, a, a white male in North America, if I even had access to the things that we offer to international students or ethnic students, um, then great. I would be able to continue my formal academic education within the LCMS, um, you know, approved channels. But as a member of an LCMS congregation, not having the right ethnicity and not having um not preparing myself for an ethnic ministry, um, there's really really only one path. And, you know, that that is to, you know, move to St. Louis or or Fort Wayne. Now, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Residential. Um, Why couldn't you go through SMP? Some people are probably asking. I can go through SMP. And right now, and and I may very well do that at some point, but, you know, you go through the work and exercise of SMP. um, You don't get a degree. Um, you get the blessing of the church and you can perform in that capacity in some even still limited capacity. Um, but, um, but that's a, that's a full course load. Um, I'm not prepared. I'm not in a place, um, professionally to take a full course load, maybe when I retire, but that'll be in another few years. And that will even shorten the amount of time that I can continue to serve the church. Um, so those are the reasons for that. Primarily the Institute of Lutheran theology allows me to continue to grow in my own spirituality. It continues for me to be a better advocate, a better lay person to serve the ministry here in Alaska in this context. And so I can take a class at a time. I can take two or three classes at a time. Um, the education is good. It's, or, it's orthodox. It's confessional. Um, so it allows me to continue. You know, I guess in short, this has been the prayer that I've had, Tim, for the last few years is, OK, I'm at a place where, Father God, what do you want of me? Do you want me in professional ministry? Do you want me to continue to support professional ministry financially like we're able to now? And the response I keep getting back is, why do I have to choose? 
figure out a way to do both. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a harder answer, but <laughs> it's the one, it's the one that's been placed on my heart. So this is what I have to wrestle with. You know, I want to continue to maintain the support of ministries and continue to grow ministries as my wife and I have a heart for and are able to do here. Um, but yes, also to continue to work in those ministries and support them. And so I'm left with this. And so far, this has been, you know, the most prayerful and, and the best solution forward. So I don't know. Wow. Does that kind of answer your question? Well, it does. So does the ILT, the Institute for Lutheran Theology, does that give an MDiv or is it just kind of a oh, certification? Yeah. It gives, uh, I'm in an MA program now taking, a, you know, coursework is as much as I can. Um, and that can lead into an MDiv and a PhD. It's fully accredited. Um, and it's, it's, it's all online. It's, it's great. It's robust. It's, it's difficult. Um, but yeah. And cost uh, just to get in the weeds a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Talk you know, cost. it's about 1500 bucks a class, um, maybe 1600 bucks. And then of course you spend a few hundred bucks on, um, books, books and things of that nature. But you know, right now that that's not a stumbling block for me. Um, they do have scholarship programs and things of that nature. Most of the classes that I'm taking, I'm by far the oldest person there. Um, <laughs> um, and, and these are, you know, LCMS SMP pastors are taking these classes, um, using this as a resource to supplement their SMP education. Um, a lot of SMP pastors are taking these classes, a lot of LCMC pastors working towards ordination and NALC as well. Well, and, and the reason SMP guys would be taking this is because they want a degree, right? Yes. Well, they want a degree and they want and they you know, some of the educational components that the SMP program doesn't build in. You know, there's there's no languages Such as. and there's some other things yeah. that um, that they want to round out. Right now, there is an SMP pastor in my world religion class. And I don't recall, I, I've reviewed the S&P curricula, but it's been a little while. I don't know how much time they spend on world religions, but he's taking this class because he wants to explore that further. The interesting thing you told me is that that Dr. Jack Kilcrease, again, a layman, academic, yeah. is, as far as you're aware, possibly on a task force exploring alternate routes uh, to ordination. Is that right? Yeah, Coming out he of last went Synod to convention? Synod, yeah, he went to, I'm pretty sure he went to Synod Convention, but he was named to be on the task force that was to explore all, you know, additional paths towards ordination. And I don't remember what, what overture that was that came, the number that was attached to it, but there was a task force that was created to explore additional paths towards ordination. And he said that he was on that commission. I haven't spoken to him um yet about what's come out of that or anything but yeah he's a layman um grew up wells now has, has served in the LC, lcms church for a number of years now he's uh, a theologian and currently is uh faculty at the institute of lutheran theology so some people wonder is there really a, a market for like more pathways and things like that and uh, well, I can't. Yes. Yes, there is. is what I, I, think. I can't speak, yes. you know, outside of my own, you know, narrow context here. But what I find in the next generation of young people is that what they crave is authenticity. They don't need the smoke and mirrors. They don't need the light show. They don't need some of the trappings um, that have come into the broader cultural Christian experience. But what they do want is authenticity. Um, and so that's where I'm seeing our theology and the depth of thinking of our apologetics and the rigors of it are appealing and people want to know more in our own congregational setting. You know, Alaska is the most unchurched state in the nation. Wow. And so most of the people that are sitting in our LCMS congregations don't have, didn't grow up in the church, didn't grow up in oftentimes any church, let alone a Lutheran church, let alone an LCMS church. So we've got work to do even amongst our own brothers and sisters, let alone the broader community. Man, yeah, so, so good. So I've talked to district presidents, many, many district presidents, 
who are waiting right now. You talk about four vacancies in your area, right? That have in the Pacific Southwest district, and I could be wrong with this president Gibson, but I, I think you, he said there was 60 some vacancies right now in our, in our district. So those are only unfortunately going to, to increase. And unless we focus on raising up, uh, raising up general ordination pastors. Yeah. So those that can serve in their, in their context, those that can, and here's what I sense in, in men like you, as I get, I get so many emails, like the one I got from you, I sense a humility. I, I sense like, yeah, I'd love to come underneath the guy that experienced the gold standard of residential education. They got to sit at the feet of the Dr. Beerman's and, and beyond, you know, and, and I'd like, I just, I just want to serve. And I don't even, I I see here a lot of the guys, like, I don't even care. Like if it takes me a while to get to ordination, I just want to be continue to be formed here as a vicar. So right now we're running the test, right? I got a whole host of men in your season of life, kind of between your season and maybe a a little bit older. And they're just like, I'll be a vicar for the next three, four, five, until we get done with our training and until the church kind of figures out what to do (laughs) with men like you and those going through ILT and those going through the Luther house of studies and Maybe there's an LCMS kind of more branded path that gets placed underneath Kairos University. These guys are just kind of like, okay, you you academics and you current pastors that did all that. Uh, hopefully you can get your stuff together and figure out that the church needs to raise up more leaders for local congregations and to start. Because a lot of the guys, this is one of the things that's like so, so evident to me, um, is that, my goodness, Ty, you, you've run a business for a long period of time, you're, you're a you're a business owner. You work with the clients. Uh, you so much of your business skills yeah. can and should be leveraged to reach people with the gospel yeah. today. Like I don't know why we don't take that into account more consistently. Anything more to say about what the bivocational and co-vocational, mm-hmm. who's been the professional, brings into the church? Yeah, you know, um, I own two companies. Arbor Capital is one, and we've got nine employees spread spread throughout the country. Um, but the other business I own and was a founder of is Denali Brewing Company um, in Denali Spirits. And we have about 160 employees there. Um, and wow. so, you know, it, it, it takes a fair amount of organizational skill. Um, and as a man of faith, it takes a certain kind of way of delivering that organizational skill. Um, that really, really does a good job of preparing you for ministry, navigating difficult church settings. I mean, a volunteer organization runs very differently than one when you're, where you're delivering paychecks every two weeks. I get that. Right. But even within staff of a growing ministry, having these types of skills, the maturity um, that, 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 that comes as a byproduct of that, um, the church could use a lot of, um, for sure. <laughs> Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll move off of that. Just just I can go down the formation uh, path easily. But let's get a little higher as we close here. Uh, third question. What are your thoughts on missiology and ecclesiology? These are big words that get thrown thrown around quite a bit. And I've, I've written and spoken a fair amount that it appears we're going Christology, ecclesiology and missiology. Uh, and one of I'll set this up like this. When I was a uh, when I was a young pastor, I think 26, 27, um, I think it was Bill Woolsey actually with 5-2 before he even like fully, fully launched 5-2, came up to me and, and asked the question, um, a number of guys probably, probably Norbesh, probably Norbesh would have probably asked this question to me. Tim, uh, does the church have a mission or does God's mission have a church? And I'm like kind of scratching my head like, oh, my gosh, is this a riddle? What what are we doing? Right. What are we doing here? But I mean, they were very, very intense about it. Yep. Does the church have a mission or the mission have a church? And the, the correct answer, according to Scripture, according to God's divine love story, is God has a mission to get all of his kids back. And the means through which he accomplishes that mission is through is through the church, through the proclamation of the gospel, through word and sacraments. And God's ultimate end is the restoration of all things, the return of Jesus to make all things new. So he is the, as John says, the word made flesh. He's the cosmic Christ. And our, our number one mission is for the sake of the world. 
that the world would would hear. I have written these things that you would believe, John says, right? And that by believing, you would have life in his his name. So your thoughts, though, on the state of the LCMS right now as it relates to missiology and ecclesiology, Ty? Well, you know, worshiping and growing up in the faith in an outpost of the LCMS here in Alaska, my experience maybe is a little bit different. I don't know. I can only speak to it, though. And I'm going to keep my comments fairly short because I'll, uh, I'm probably sophomoric um, in my thinking about those two things. But my experience has been through missiology. And through uh, the, the, the approach, the missional approach that brought me deeper into the faith, I began to study and learn about the church and grew in my love for the church. So the ecclesiology is an important part of that because it's important for us to know where we came from, how we got to where we are, why we are the way that we are. We cannot abandon our roots. We can't lose our moorings in that. Um, but but yet it doesn't it shouldn't dictate to us externally. So I guess it's a blend. And I think I wrote in my response to you that it was kind of a blend. The missiology leads to for me anyway, led to an, a better understanding of ecclesiology. Um, but the ecclesiology should point back to missiology and, and they're connected in some way that or at least that's been my experience. Maybe that's singular yeah. to me. I don't know. No, uh, let's let's talk about liturgy. The liturgy can be brought, so we the divine service. It can be presented in in such a way, uh, and I think we do a great job across the board here of recognizing that we are being served by God. Right. This is one of the main distinctives of Lutheran worship: is it's not us bringing anything outside of our sin to God. And him serving us through the forgiveness of sins, uh, through the hearing of the word, through his his body and blood. Uh, but the whole service itself is kind of like a, a reorientation of God's missional love story, right? From, mm-hmm. from baptism uh, through, this is confession absolution, right? Through rebellion, <laughs> right? I confess I'm a poor, miserable, wretched sinner of sin and thought, word and deed, com- oh, sins of omission and commission. So then we see kind of rebellion. And yet God has promised something for us. He promised uh, that he would not leave us. He promised through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Israel's raised up, and the prophets uh, then try to call Israel back to faith. But God took matters into his own hands in in Jesus, the word made flesh. And so we gather to hear God's word consistently. And then like the disciples, Jesus, will you please teach us how to pray? Will you please come alongside us? Because we yearn for that deeper, intimate relationship with our heavenly father. Jesus teaches us how to pray. Uh, We orient around who we are and the mission we've been called to. What do we proclaim? This is our creedal understanding. And then Lo, I'm with you always. How is he with us through his body and blood? And then we head off with most of us, the ironic benediction, which for the the Jews, the Israelites would have been God's present presence goes with me as I'm sent out into the world, out into the wilderness, out to different vocations, out to people who are far from God. So even the liturgy has this kind of mission orientation to it. It, yeah. it God's word comes to us. And then, and then it flows through us as we move out into into the world. Any other take on the divine liturgy uh, and the missional bent of it, Ty? Yeah, you know, you 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 brought up a good point there. Um, the one thing that we do well um, in the LCMS is that we recognize that you know worship services and Bible study. It's unique. It's independent. This is not where we somebody stands up front and and delivers educational content for half an hour and calls it a sermon. It's an interactive worship service um, between God and us, both individually and collectively, with sacraments being so central to to that. So, but what is lost, at least what I find, um, is that there is a diminishing understanding of the liturgy and what it does and what its role and why we're doing what we're doing. So one of the things that that might be worthwhile is to find additional ways for us to inform and educate. If you grew up in a liturgical setting, great. You have done this. You find great comfort in it. And you probably have, are surrounded by a faith family that informs you as to why we're doing what we're doing. So many of us 
And as the U.S. gets less and less culturally Christian, we are going to have to find a way to preserve the liturgy, but also communicate it and demonstrate it in a way that lets people know why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to do the liturgy, to have the components of the liturgy. There's a lot of ways to educate and communicate that. Um, but we don't really have a lot of that. We just assume everybody kind of gets it. Um, well, I think there's room, Ty, for theological hospitality here. Yeah. Uh, and theological hospitality would look like, hey, I'm going to offer uh, a series of classes yeah. on why we worship all of the components of the divine service, um, letting them know that we're we're passive in reception primarily. Right. You know, God's work for us. And then we're we're actively mobilized in love for the world. So you could draw out the two kinds of righteousness uh, very, very easily there. And then in, in some of our services, and I, I know that uh, sometimes explanation can kind of stifle the holiness, the otherness of the liturgy. And so we want to be careful and not like over explaining, but sometimes in, in transition, and I'll, I'll just give one example. Uh, I, I get the privilege of, of preaching and I can do some teaching and do from time to time kind of an introductory statement before I get into my into my message is something right. like, isn't yeah. it amazing how we've just remembered our baptism, uh, confessed who we were and yeah. apart from Christ and now with Christ. And and now we're prepared, right? We're prepared to to lean into the hearing of, of God's word, which never returns empty and void. Like I can say something like that as I head into the sermon and we maybe we just get more intentional in those kind of transitions additional teaching moments, because you're exactly right. Um, in our congregation, there are the vast majority of people did not grow up Lutheran. Now, that may be the exception, obviously, in some Midwestern churches, but well over half have come to us from some other tradition. Uh, so, yeah, we to be clear is to be kind, right? And we, we should be kind. People want, like, Lutheran worship, divine service, like it actually makes sense. The telling of that story makes sense. But yeah. if we if we're not theologically hospitable, um, yeah, we're, we're going to miss miss out. And, and folks will think then we're just we're kind of strange. Like we look very different. Right. than a lot of the mainline evangelical churches and, and praise be to God. But we got to explain it. Go ahead, Ty. Well, I was just going to say, if I can give a quick plug for the MTC, the Mission Training Center here, um, they've got a couple of courses, uh, one specifically called Lutheran Worship. And it's a great class where you can just get into the whys, the reasons, the historicity that supports the liturgy and all of those types of things. So uh, if anybody's out there listening, um, you can audit the course, you can take the course as part of. Um, but but anyway, there are there is some um, further study available that really will will really open up and and enliven the liturgy, um, hey. you know, through a little bit of study. Ty, this has been so much fun, brother. I'm grateful uh, that Jesus led you to the LCMS, and I'm grateful you're continuing to learn and and serve. And um, I'm just very, very optimistic that our church is filled with with leaders uh, like you. Just saying, here I am, Jesus, uh, use me. And you can do both things at the same time. It appears to be the fuel that fired up the early church. A lot of bivocational and co-vocational <laughs> leaders, and we need them now today uh, more than ever. Ty, if people want to connect with you, how can they do so, brother? Um, I Well, you've got my contact information. They should be able to reach out to you. Um, do you should I share it now here, or how do I best yeah, do you, that? You can. You can if you got your email. Just your email. Okay, yeah. Ty at... Arbor, A-R-B-O-R, capital, dot I-O. All right. Love it. Love it. He is Ty Schomer. I am uh, Tim Allman. This is Lead Time Hot Topic Friday. I pray the joy of the Lord is your strength and come back next week for more enriching conversations as we grow up into Jesus, who is our head, our leader, our Lord. It's a good day. Go make it a great day. Wonderful work, Ty. All right. Bye now. Thanks. You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC's mission is to collaborate with the local church to discover, develop, and deploy leaders through biblical Lutheran doctrine and innovative methods. To partner with us in this gospel message, subscribe to our channel, then go to theuniteleadership.org to create your free login for exclusive material and resources, and then to explore ways in which you can sponsor an episode. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.